So hello, everybody. Uh, this is the Open Global Mind call for Thursday, April 13th, uh, 2023. This is a check-in call. I'm Ken Homer sitting in for Jerry Mikulski, and uh, welcome to our show. So uh, the floor is open for anybody who would like to comment on what's going on in their lives or tell us something interesting. I'll be glad to start with something. Please, Kevin, go ahead. I've, I've been, and we're finishing up this conference on economic justice in Jackson, Mississippi. So I'm looking for what's new. And I've been in touch with this uh, Indian woman named Deepa, who is kind of doing the best cataloging of impact DAOs uh, anywhere through a series of you know two or three podcasts a week, but then analysis. And she knows you know, all the infrastructure parts of the thing and the little bitty things that make the trains run on the tracks or whatever they do, and then the people doing it and, and the people funding it and stuff. And so she and I are collaborating on Twitter. Uh, I've gotten my buddy Doug Rushkoff a little bit engaged, and we want to do a, an impact DAO theme at our conference in February um, that'll be domestic and 65% per, percent social and the 35% toward economic, I mean, toward uh, environmental justice and um, use a donut economic lens to put it together. You know, the safe operating space for people in, on this planet. And I think it's going to be kind of cool. Sounds fantastic, Kevin. <clears throat> yeah, um, it's the kind of thing you can build in Twitter. Is this a... Um, uh... An in-person conference, a, a hybrid conference yeah, yeah. online. It is. It is an in-person conference, but but it, this is part of the thing where the Impact Dow folks really use Twitter a lot, and um, so you know they're still here and because it's still working for them. So it, it'll be we can use Twitter to to build it and get people to decide. You know, you know the, the the premise is that Impact Dow's are the best way to build a collective pools of resilience within watersheds, uh, linking mutuality to redesign the economy in a way that we can all survive uh, because you can change the fucking rules because that's what it is. So anyway, uh, and there are people who know a lot more about it. I just have a hunch that I want to follow it. Sounds amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, glad, I'm pretty jazzed about it. I have a quick comment. Um, here I am at home, um, and basically, uh, Doug Rushkoff back in the '90s spent about um, three months here, maybe maybe even six months, while I was uh, working on in Laguna Beach. Um, but uh, I love Doug. Doug is Doug is just wonderful. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Well, he he, and then we're getting in with the Institute for the Future, that and they're building this. Uh, new model of the economy in the future they want to build now and i'm just sort of uh you know I, i'm involved with them and, and but he's got me involved with ift and they're going to be coming to institute for the future marina gorbis and those folks and where's the conference held kevin san antonio in february i hear texas is lovely that kind of time of year uh yeah i i think so it's a it's a better than july for sure and much better than september and august my god mm, okay well good well they suggested the date so i said okay yeah. So who's going to texas uh on april 8th next year for the total eclipse I am. Um, I uh, I traveled a couple hundred miles to do it. It, it. it was amazing how how it was amazing how how that's that's all I can say. It was amazing. I went to the total eclipse in uh, Oregon um, a couple of years ago. Took the train, um, Amtrak up, took a bike, and slept on a couch. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I mm. highly highly recommend it. I, I mentioned Texas, the path of the, the totality actually goes up through up from Mexico through Texas, and then mm -hmm. up to the Northeast. So there's a lot of it uh, in the US. But 
uh, you also want to pick a place that's likely to be uh, not cloudy that day. So Texas is, is mm. probably best. That's interesting. If you want to stay in the U.S., Mexico would be great too. How do we guarantee no clouds for that? Um, pray. Oh, okay. Um, when that works. <laughs> Isn't there something known as uh, what geoengineering? I mean, people who basically want to uh, put um, sky sails up in the sky to reflect the sun, um, you know, because we can't be bothered to recycle or something like that. I forget exactly. Go wrong. There's already a company that's that's um, putting stuff in the sky to reduce um, global warming. Not that they asked anybody's permission. They're just like, hey, we have the money. We're going to do it. It's just like Ministry for the Future. Or Neil Stevenson's last book. Uh, he has a book about, exactly about that. What's the... Uh theme of Stephenson's book? Um, it's that there's this rich guy who figures out they want to shoot uh, particles to do reflecting uh, up into the sky and then he gets uh, some Indian folks who want to do it and then other folks do it and he shows them how to do it and uh, folks in Houston and stuff like that and it's just you know no time for consensus crazy rich people scared and and realize bunkers won't work they they learn to sort of do guerrilla climate action at scale so one of the things that's wrong with that scenario is that it limits agriculture because we cut down the sun yeah I, you know sure there's a lot of things wrong with that But they, they think you know that the short-term benefit to, to give the earth some time to breathe is 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 something that will help us survive. Well, if, well, if they think that, then they should definitely do it. What the fuck about the rest of us? Well, yeah. So that's that's what the book's about. I mean, you know, there, yeah. there's there's ethics, but then you know, there's en ethics and there's engineering. You know, uh, who wins right now? Money. Well, yeah, but what if the money um, is, is wanting to do some climate stuff that the rest of us don't want to do, and, and politically, we can't get our butts out of our asses to do what's needed? Yeah, well, this is, this is Doug's scenario of the, you know, the authoritarian solution, but what if these guys are wrong? You know, we're, we're bad if, they, if they're, yeah, it could, be, it could be that they're wrong, could be that they're right, and they're doing something. So, you know, that's just, that's the premise, you know, but, but that's yep. it. Yeah. I love that phrase. Um, I don't mean to interrupt you, Ken. Please go ahead. Kevin. That was go. all I had to say. Yeah. Okay. Kevin, I love that phrase. There's ethics and then there's engineering or there's engineering. And, you know, the current AI, the current, you know, genetic make it, uh, manipulation, CRISPR, um, you know, going on back to uh, um, Manhattan Project, going back to, uh, um, you know, siege engines or you know, God knows, you know, all our technology um, is yeah. all part of us. Um, I, uh, yeah, um, we have an ethics deficit. We have a, we have a moral deficit. We have an engineering surplus. Um, not sure what to do about it. Phoebe Tickle in, uh, in England has been doing a thing called moral imaginations, which looks hmm. awfully, awfully interesting on that theme. Uh, in fact, we should maybe invite her here. Can you describe that briefly? Nope. Okay. Can you just well, whatever? Yeah. Can you put the name in the? Uh, oh, there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. I was joining the uh, uh, Al Gore Climate Reality Project uh, uh, training uh, you know, a couple of days ago, and he summarized what uh, is happening around the world um, in, in a slideshow that was just absolutely stunning. Uh, I mean, you're looking at images from Peru, one third of Peru underwater, the Yangtze River running dry, um, oil spills that no, no one really reports on. 
it's amazing how much damage there is on a planetary level already. It was really, it, it was shocking, even for me, where I look at this stuff all the time to see it bundled up. Um, I mean, it is really uh, uh, running much, much faster than 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 we can track. So it's amazing. I did a kind of survey of the news this morning, and there's almost no hint that there's climate change going on. And most people seem to assume that the thing that they're worried about is going to change, but that everything else stays the same. Like you can fly out of the problem to somewhere, like the commercial airlines are going to still be working. I was on a call uh, the other day with a bunch of media people talking about this coverage question and um, a couple of observations. One is that it's very different in Europe and the rest of the world than the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. We're a blackout zone compared to the rest of the world, which is more engaged in reality. Um, um, uh, and the other was a question of how do you get it into the media here? Obviously, with corporate control, it's it's complicated. But, uh, uh, you know, do do the weather people provide a potential channel? What if the weather people reported, if not every day, every week, gave a climate report? Um, and if you look back at the media work in the 1980s during the nuclear freeze, where there's a concerted effort to move stories uh, into news coverage, a uh, parallel effort like that could, you know, could potentially be useful today. You know, I mean, when you ask people individually, is, you know, is this like you remember it when you were a kid? Uh, and start to bring, you know, start to bring the contrast into a very personal experiential dimension rather than pictures from around the world or graphs of numbers. Uh, something starts to happen. People start to recognize, wait a minute, it wasn't, it wasn't like this. You drive Folks who are old enough to remember driving across the country through the Midwest and having your windshield covered with bugs. Doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen anymore. They're gone. Not just the Midwest, anywhere. They're gone. It's like more than seventy percent of insects are gone. Uh, you know, ocean. I mean, well, I don't need to go through the numbers. You guys know it. Uh, but so, you know, at one level, it's numbers like seventy percent or two. You know, two degrees or whatever. Another is the experience. Do you remember what it used to be like when you were a kid? There's okay. another phenomenon at work here, Gil, which is what it was like when I was a kid is also is hugely different than when what it was like when my dad was a kid 40 yeah. years before. And yeah. um, people get used to whatever's around, so they don't recognize the changes over time. Yeah. <clears throat> so how do you bring that to consciousness? And how you know what's it going to be like for your kids or their kids? If this I is once asked a guy on Martha's Vineyard who was in his 80s. The difference between now and his childhood. He scratched his head and he said, when I was a kid, when the ducks would fly over, the sky would be dark for 15 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That recently. Wow. From around five years old to around seven, um, my dad worked at uh, El Centro Naval Air Station, probably on Polaris missiles. Uh, guy, mm. I'm not exactly sure because I was five to seven. I remember seeing the moon landing on black and white TV, and I remember locust plague mm. and crickets and just horrid insects where basically um, they had to close the roads because the crickets would smush and the cars could couldn't get any traction on, on the highway. And so they would crash into each other. And I remember being in my parents' station wagon and being basically having the station wagon um, drive through um, a biplane spraying the fields and our station wagon getting covered in insecticide. Mm -hmm. Nice. Probably DDT. Yeah. Yeah. He's to run behind the DDT trucks on the army posts when I was in the four, four and five years old in the clouds. There were all there were three of us who would just run behind it for an hour or more. Mm -hmm. We aren't affected at all. Yeah. The problem, I mean, problem. I mean, the, the phenomena that, that we 
what we're dealing with, struggling with, is that you have a status quo system that that exerts so much inertia you know, that you can't move. The the I mean, and this is primarily. I mean, if we have drastic changes that have to be in the markets, right? And the markets are so centralized and so controlled that you 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 simply can't get in you know, to make to, to allow innovations to really scale up. And what you see is like this geoengineering and uh, you know lab grown uh, proteins and what have you. Those are attempts to maintain the the structure of the existing system. Uh, so that we, we can we can continue operating uh, the economy in the way it is conceived currently, and that won't work because you really have to make some fairly significant changes in in starting with decentralization, whether that's the energy system or the food system. You know, you need to decentralize and create redundancies, uh, and that just uh, is not is 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 not in the cards right now. I, if we shift I'd like to to comment on that, if I could, Doug. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Klaus used a very interesting term, the structure of the existing system. And certainly, you know, I've been paying attention to, you know, social changes in Detroit and places that have been abandoned. And, you know, you mentioned decentralization. I'm, I'm kind of really wondering about, you know, the bottom up changes that um actually do work and you know I, I know that's what you're doing and i'm kind of wondering about you know what you just said and yes the system is difficult to change but we're, what we tend to do is you know i'm not i'm not a policy wonk i basically you know hang out with my friends and say you know what let's go to the Go to the forest and take some deep breaths and and you know bring some organic food with us um certainly that's not scale so i, I wonder you know what you do seems to be a bottom-up kind of approach and i'm wondering how given you talk about the structure of the existing system and how difficult it is to change do you imagine that we can do a bottom-up thank you class you want to respond to that yeah, I mean, we just started, you know, I've been bouncing all over the place and I'm, I'm embedded with the Sierra Club and 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 there is some some really uh, uh, good energy uh, development there, um, citizen climate lobby and so on, but and which really taught me how the uh, legislative process works, the legal process. So, so there is great deal of engagement with Regenerate America, you know, with lobbying efforts. I have been personally able to to participate in meetings with Senate and, and House members um, from an educational perspective, so that's that's all that's all running. We, we are now, you know, if you're really interested in looking at what we could do, I've come down to the point where, where we just have to disseminate information. You just have to let people know, and and uh, so you know, we started the project with this Monday meeting where. Uh, we are trying to connect Garden World, you know, Doug's uh, 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 vision of a destination, right? Garden World is a place to, to go towards uh, and talk about a pathway. How do you get from here to there? So, and, and, and with that is the, the thought that we should use to look at Donald Lameadow's leverage points of the system because when you have that, what it does, it goes from narrative. It's an upside down pyramid, right? You go, uh, the, the narrative carries the system. And my apologies. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I can't, I, I have to call you back. Um, the, the, so, so, so to, to go, so to translate the, the narrative, what does this narrative mean now? to the next layer down, to the administrative level, to the next level down, to the engineering level. Mm -hmm. you know, so so you, need to, uh, you need to come down to the point where uh, this makes sense to the chef in a catering operation, to the purchasing manager, 
of a restaurant chain, right? So to translate the information down, so you have a common vision uh, that can be that can be operationalized, so to speak. And and all we can do at this point is is create a pathway so people can visualize, you know, how how that how that may work. Gil, yeah. <clears throat> creating a path that people can visualize, I think, is deeply important. It's been a core part of the you know theory of change that I've worked with for decades, from Institute for Local Self Reliance on up. Um, uh, Ken um, Ken Bolding used to say that existence is proof of the possible. You know? And if you can show if you can show people something that exists, they can no longer say it's not possible. There it is in front of them. So, class, I disagree with where you started uh, about the possibility of innovation. We are awash in innovation. Uh, there's incredible innovation happening around the planet, um, around uh, renewables and ag and some and buildings and some transportation and so many issues. Uh, the um, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know the the the, the um, price advantage of renewables over fossils is moving very rapidly. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details on that, but there's enormous momentum. It's not covered in mainstream media. That's another thing that we don't see enough about. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, from, you know, from technology to grassroots, there's incredible momentum around the world. Is it sufficient? No. Um, uh, you know, we've still got a world where 100 companies are responsible for 70% of the climate emissions. Um, you know, we've still got a world where you know, there's a, the, the fossil companies need to leave $100 trillion of assets in the ground for us to stabilize the climate. And like any rational capitalist actor, they're going to maximize their assets as long as they can, which means they're going to drill uh, until they have to stop. And they're going to be stopped by one of two things. Either the pri pricing will make it uneconomic to do it, uh, which is a slow solution, or they're going to be forced to stop. And they know that. Uh, there's enormous activity in Houston on what they call energy transition. One of my clients has embedded herself into that game, which is kind of crazy. Um, uh, but you know, under the current rules, uh, they will drill until they have to stop. And how do they stop? It's you know, it's it's regulations, it's votes, and it's the street. Um, the good news is that um, you know we've got super majorities in the United States on a lot of issues, on abortion, on guns, and so forth. We don't have it yet on climate, but the demographics are with us. Younger vote, younger people are very different on these issues than older people are. Um, the challenge there is that uh, uh, is is getting folks out to vote or to be in the street or whatever. There was a piece in the Times yesterday uh, about the declining voter participation of Black voters in the United States uh, and the critical impact that's going to have on the next election. Um, so, um, you know. I, 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 I'm not as despairing, Klaus, as you are. I see the forces mounting for this battle, um, but there's a lot of work to be done. And I think part of it is, is uh, you know, the name that I'll give to what Kevin and folks are doing is it's not just top down or bottom up. It's it's this distributed process uh, uh, at all levels across the planet. And scale doesn't just happen by hockey stick. Scale happens by horizontal spread or what I call the distributed, the distributed scale. Of the federated small, you know, scale happening in lots of places a little bit and adding up into something that's hard to see, but is actually in motion. End of rant. Thank you, Gil. I just make one comment. Um, we may have supermajorities, but we also lack uh, the in the way of the supermajority is the existing power structure. Um, Pat Rushkoff, uh, Lessig, and, and, and the street can. So, so Lessig came and did a presentation a couple of years ago at uh, Dominican University here. And he said, you know, you can have a 90% agreement among the American public that they want a law passed and has the exact same chance of passing as something that has a 30% agreement because Congress doesn't listen to the American public. They listen to the people who pay them. And so even though we have a supermajority, that power structure hasn't tipped in our favor yet, but it's it's in process. I think there's an awful lot of um, stuff under the surface, as you point out, that's not being reported. And uh, you know, I'm hopeful things will change, but I'm I'm not hopeful they'll change uh, in the time frame that's needed. Nor am I. But and that's why I said the, the, uh, that's why I said the votes and the street. Yeah. 
Well, look what's happening in Tennessee right now. I was going to say, look at Tennessee. You know, uh, if anybody doesn't know, they uh, uh, they reinstated the two uh, gentlemen that were thrown out of the legislature, and um, people are really pissed, especially young people. Um, they're like, we're just not going to put up with this anymore. We this Justin Pearson, I think, said, you know, I didn't come here to be shut up. I'm come, I'm here to fight for you. So that's pretty hopeful stuff. Can I say one more thing about Tennessee? Before sure. Doug, if you give me a moment, if you do give me permission, Doug, for a moment. Um, um, I learned this on the uh, on the news last night. Uh, um, Pearson and Jones are both 27. Um, and, you know, then they're on fire and they're strong. And it's, a, you know, it's an indication of, of, of where the younger generation maybe is. Uh, yesterday was the 60th anniversary of the day that another 27 year old black man in the South was arrested and put in prison um, for, uh, I think it was uh, eight days in Birmingham, Alabama, by himself in a cell with no mattress in the dark, um, had a newspaper smuggled into him with a letter from uh, a bunch of white pastors in town saying, we think you know these are important issues, but it should be handled through normal channels and votes and the courts and so forth, but not by people being in the streets. And this 27-year-old man wrote a 21-page letter that you know is the letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, Reverend King at 27, same age as these two guys. I just found that that, that, that was a goosebump thing for me, the resonant the power of that. And I forgot how young he was. I guess because he was older than me, so he seemed old. But I forgot how young he was at the time that he did what he did. And so, you know, there's there are generations there are generations coming behind us that are going to do shit that we never imagined. And that's one of the places I take some hope. Thanks, Gil. Doug. Okay. So, uh, two things, uh, Gil. I worry that you you sound more like an advocate than an analyst of what's happening. So, when you talk about the oil energy companies. Uh, stopping, for example, if we stop the oil flow, the impact on the infrastructure and almost all organizations would be huge. Things would come to a stop. Uh, we, we've got to analyze how that might go uh, rather than just say, let's do that. Doug, let me interrupt you. Let, let, me, let me finish my points. I, I want you to just represent me accurately. I'm not saying that we should stop all the flow of oil instantly. Not at all. No, but you use the word stop a number of times. Okay. So I just want to say stopping has consequences we've got to pay attention to. Um, what I, re well, that's taken me away from what I really wanted to say. So I'll pass for the moment. We'll come back to you, Doug. Stacy. Let me apologize. Um, I'm feeling a little sick inside. I uh, put my dog to sleep yesterday. Um, oh. And after, and the conversation's making me kind of sick as well. Um, after I put him to sleep, I went to see a friend of mine who lives out in the woods on an estate because I needed to be in nature. And we were sitting and talking and he was telling me how you know, he goes through the woods with his dog, and there are many other really big estates there, many that have been left to open space. And how he does the rounds because he wants to, a lot of them were designed by famous architects and they're being vandalized because the two counties that they were left to, nothing's been done with them. They were supposed to be set up as education, and we were talking about the farms that could be done and you know the how the land could be used and uh I asked him I said well you know like what's going on because he's very active with all sorts of projects like that usually through the church he does architectural things and historical things and he said um no money no organization and it reminded me of you know Klaus had been on another call and I get what I'm trying to say is I get I, I'm happy when I hear Klaus and Kevin talk because they're really the only two people I hear that 
I feel like they really understand there is a need to grab the people up from the bottom and get them working. Normally what I hear is we have to fix things and we can do it from up here. And I, I have a, I'm in a unique position. I've been around people that have a project and all they have to do is mention it. And one of their rich friends will be like, oh, you need 30,000? No problem. You got it. And then I've been around people that can't rub two cents together to get their, you know, their little thing going. And it's just, it's just hurting me inside knowing that there isn't more of an effort. I mean, maybe we need experts to get teams together and go to town and, and help officials. I mean, I don't know, but something in between feels like it's missing. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Stacy, and my condolences on the passing of your beloved Thank family you. member. Thank you. Thank you Doug, did you want to come back now or you want to wait? Yeah, I did. And I wanted to ask a, a question of Klaus. Klaus, uh, if we went to a more localized scenario for food production, do the tools and the seeds exist to support that? Or do we have a problem? No, we have all the tools, all the know-how. Uh, it is stunning, uh, really, what happened just since I started uh, engaging here for you know, a few years back. The problem right now is access to markets. So when I listen to my farmer friends, um, there are people who, who have a regenerative crop, you know, a high quality crop that is uh, devoid of or very low in chemicals and so on and so on, high nutrient content, they can't get, they can't sell it. Uh, the market refuses to accept it. You know? So they end up having to put it into the silo at uh, the same cost as the GMO crops. And so the the, the, the design paradigm currently is top down, right? So the, the industry uh, is basically dictating the, to the farmer, use this particular seed, use the, raise it with these chemicals uh, and, uh, uh, and bring it to maturity in this and this way. It doesn't matter whether that's animal uh, uh, husbandry or raising corn, soy and wheat. Uh, we have to turn that upside down because in order to regenerate the soil, you need to you need to customize what is being grown by bioregion because each bioregion has different types of soil, different access to water, different climates, and so on. But when you do that, then the food industry has to accommodate you know, these differences in crops. So, for example, when you now look at Europe, Europe is is a landmass you now somewhere let's say equal to the United States. Look at how many cultures are sitting on top of Europe, you know, you, and, and how they are expressing themselves in different types of cuisines. So you have the German, the French, the Italian, the Greeks, right? The Mediterranean realm and so on. And the reason this evolved that way is because over hundreds of generations, really, they figured out what they can grow sustainably on that land. And they were able to live there for thousands of years. Let's think about Japan, for example, Vietnam, China. They were able to live on that land for thousands of years without destroying their soil. What we are doing is we have already lost 40% of our soil in the United States. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's catastrophic what, what uh, our current agricultural system, our, our form of, of growing and, and consuming food does to the environment. You know, and that change is going to be as profound as the change required in the energy systems. And, and you know, just to put up the, a final point to it, one third of global emissions are caused by the way we grow and raise food. One third. That's now the IPCC uh, the, uh, 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 official statement here. So we can stop the the. the uh, uh, carbon outputs in the energy sector today, and it wouldn't make any difference. This, the food system would push us over the edge, which it already it is doing on so many levels, right? Because it's not just CO2. You know, it's watersheds, it's water depletion. I mean, there are so many issues related to it. So it's access to markets right now. That's the critical, uh, the critical issue. Thank you, Klaus. 
Mr. Jones, and welcome, Jerry. Um, <clears throat> you know, somebody said, you know, what do we need to do? Do we need to send somebody to the cities? You know, I was thinking today or yesterday about, uh, you know, that's a really good idea that's actually really, really terrible. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation put up about $100 million to do uh, resilience officers in like 50 cities around the world, but they didn't integrate them with the disaster support folks. And that's who, who is on the front line of, you know, the, the, the sewers backing up and everything like that. And so they were paid and they got an office, but they were never invited to a meeting because the Rockefeller said, this is a new idea. You guys need to go along. And only New Orleans went along because New Orleans was in really bad trouble. So we're looking to get funded a role we call the system entrepreneur that connects uh, all the groups working on things and is not an ED of any one thing uh, across, um, you know, like race class zip code and across uh, uh, local watersheds uh, uh, to do, we're using a donut economics lens because it's the only thing that gets the, the environmentalists to think about poor folks. Uh, usually they're, you know, environmentalists by their heritage are, are genocidal. They like the pristine wilderness, God bless them. But, it, you know, it's always, uh, the poor folks downstream are always the last. But with this donut economics, I'm finding that you can keep environmentalists at the table when a social issue is up front. So, and I think, you know, small scale networked coordinated uh, collective ch climate change is, is the only way we can go forward. So anyway. So, so Kevin, um, at, at first you said it's a terrible idea, but I think you meant that the way it was done originally, it just didn't work. They, they, they had a disjunct. And then I found in my brain an article from Rockefeller Foundation describing system entrepreneurs. Does that mean that they're on the right track or has this? Well, yeah, they got, you know, I mean, after, after wasting a hundred million dollars, they realized this is part of what they see as, as right, as opposed to this adjunct staff with a budget that, you know, you don't know who's already doing it and what their budget constraints are. And you, you don't go in and help the folks who are already doing stuff. They came in with Rockefeller and they had enough money to get an office and, uh, and, and a person staffed. And uh, they, had no, they had no idea you had to listen to people who were already doing stuff. You know, God are, bless the foundation. Have they fixed it? Are they, are they better oriented now? No, no. They, 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 uh -huh. they, they completely wasted $100 million. Uh, you That's know, awesome. but it's... Yeah, well, you know, it's it's an it, it, instructive failures are great, you know. Don't do it like that. You know. Do you Thanks. think they've learned that? What's that? You think they've learned from the failure? You know, foundations have no predators, so there's no pressure for them to evolve. Yeah. They are now writing about and what I found with foundations is that they will write about the flaws in their theory of change, but they won't only uh, some of them are starting to change the assumptions of power, yeah. but they usually come in as the strategic person, you know, the, the landscape architect and they hire nonprofits to cut the grass, you know. So it's, it's the power stuff of foundations, you know? but they're getting better about that. So just to recenter us, because uh, we've gotten off on agriculture and a few other things here, this is a check-in call. If anybody would like to check in what's going on with them, uh, the floor is open. Mr. Carranza. Um, thank you. I appreciate everybody on this call. Um, I work at the Internet Archive. Mm. We are being sued. Mm. We are being sued by publishers who hope to take um, the ability of libraries to do controlled digital lending, to basically take the books that they have and you know scan them or you know get a digital copy and basically the large corporations you know any vc if you're starting a information startup will basically insist that you do surveillance on your customers so when you Get an ebook through Amazon or through other ebook, 
you know, readers, basically they're tracking your reading. They're tracking what you read. They're tracking how many pages you turn. They're tracking, um, you know, who you basically have in your contact list. If you're, you know, sharing, you know, your reading with people. We're against that. We think it's creepy. And the suit will probably go to the Supreme Court. And basically the argument is we paid the authors. We control access to what you read. As a library, we're very careful not to store what people are reading unless they want to. If they want to share it, that's great. My check-in, um, some people know, that a lot of people die. In tragic circumstances and accidents, and it's been too much. We basically had to stop working. Getting help and getting disability and getting on disability and, and basically, you know, navigating the mental health system is a nightmare a full-time job and has caused even more stress but i'm resilient as fuck and certain friends have helped in critical ways and very thankful um doing all right um but i'm gonna take some time <laughs> off it took a while to basically get an official leave of absence. It's taken two months. And that's just wrong. And I still haven't gotten, you know, the disability. So I guess, what is it? Um, anyway. Um, yeah, I'm hurting right now. Hurting serious. But I can see that um, other people you know, when I when I go and, and, you know, hang out with other people and, and they've got worse problems, you know what? It doesn't make me feel good, but it heals me to help them. And that's been my salvation, at least, for the last couple months. Um, I'm heading down to San Diego. Hope maybe to visit with Pete. Maybe. Um, and... Uh, friend of mine's flying in from Baltimore and we were talking he's Christian <coughs> and, um make this short and uh move on to I believe Hank um and we were talking about the Tennessee murders and we we're talking I mean it was it was a date of the Louisville Kentucky <clears throat> shooting and I am raging about it and people are like, Mark, you can't rage. We have, you know, this is this is a workspace. Fuck that. I am not going to shut down my emotion Ooh. to basically mollycoddle somebody who's me. I, that's microaggression. Fuck that. That's aggression. That's assertive. I have emotions and I'm going to express them. Thank you. If it's unexpectable in the workplace, well, I'm going to take a leave of absence and let you know that stuff go. But the point is, he lives in Baltimore, and we were talking about the frenzy on the news media about you know some bank presidents getting killed, some little girls getting killed. And he said, "Mark, here in Baltimore, there's 50 murders every weekend." every weekend of the year and they don't get covered happens in chicago happens in cleveland it's not being part of the news media coverage which yeah um forgive me for saying this because i don't mean it in a way that could be construed but you know, he and I were saying, yeah, these little white girls get killed, these little white, you know, not little white, but these, you know, really nice people, you know, bank presidents and, and, and the girls. And the media freaks out. And 
we're missing so many other deaths. And I'm pissed. And I'm doing what I can to heal. Thank you. Um, Hank, um, you might want to take a little silence, but maybe not. I'm not going to enforce that. Thank you for listening. That's a very powerful sharing, Mark. So I do want to take a little silence. And uh, or to revert to other themes after your sharing, even one so all encompassing as climate change. However, the check-in I was planning to do uh, has a lot to do with the first uh, uh, 30 or 40 minutes of this uh, conversation. So I'm gonna do it. Uh, I've been uh, reading Damon Santola's book about change, how to make big things happen. It's a very important book, at least I'm two thirds of the way through and I realize He's saying very important things. And I'm trying to understand how it would work with people's awareness uh, of the need for collaborative action on climate change. In an interview in this morning's uh, Dutch newspaper, uh, uh, Annie Dasgupta, who's president of the World Resources Institute, said that among the many great dangers facing the planet, he thinks the greatest danger to addressing climate change is that uh, most people don't really deeply understand the consequences of what would happen to the earth if warming goes above one and a half degrees centigrade. This is about both personal and public ima imagination. And he also said that another obstacle for anyone to accept stories about climate change is that the message is too often framed as you must do this and you can't do that. And there are all these other things you have to give up and it's going to be very painful, but it's really important. And uh, my conclusion, his conclusion, although he didn't say it that way, is you can't sell sacrifice. There are not enough stories about what the benefits of collaboratively, collaboratively addressing climate change would be. More livable cities, cleaner air, uh, uh, less inequality in the world. So I'm trying to think in terms of, of, of Damon Santola, uh, who are the most relevant people to tell these stories. Santola talks about uh, the difference if you want to establish legitimacy of a message or credibility of a message or the relevance of a message. He more or less says, at least how I understood him, that it's the people who are most similar to you are the relevant ones. They're the ones that you're going to believe. So sort of paraphrasing what I heard, I guess it was Gil say earlier, no, it, it was uh, Kevin, uh, downstream uh, networks uh, close to the ground. Is that the way to get the message of what real consequences are going to be to people and their families and their children? Or is it the diversity of the people who have come with a similar message? And that's what I'm trying to work out. And perhaps others on this call who have also read Centola might be interested in talking about that either in this call or, or other calls. Because I think what Centola is trying to tell us is that change, social change, uh, systems change, paradigm change can happen, but what's the best way to reach the people who need to change? 
So I'll uh, end my uh, check-in with that. Thank you, Hank. Jerry, whenever you're ready. Um, thanks for hosting, Ken. I really appreciate it. And oh, sure. um, sorry when I jumped in, I got all excited about what Kevin was talking about and completely forgot our protocols. And <laughs> you'd think I'd know better, but there we are. Um, I have like three different things con con like competing for, for space in my head right now. One of them is lots of really interesting generative conversations around generative AI. Um, I attended a meetup here in Portland where there were some speakers, uh, Pete and I and Stacy and others were on a call recently where uh, a lot of the stuff was just burbling and, and, and seething in really nice ways. And it just feels like there's a lot of potential in the air. I'll, I'll sort of keep it at that. But, but we're, just at the, we're just at a very lovely and potentially dangerous moment, um, which these moments tend to sort of look like now and then. I want to honor that. Uh, second thing is, I'm sort of trying to get myself back on the speaking circuit as a way of making a living. I prototyped a talk called Confessions of a Cyborg a couple Sundays ago, courtesy of Kevin Clark inviting me to give it for a group, and then had another conversation with a friend who really knows the speaking market, and she suggested some other sorts of themes, so I'm trying to sort my way through all of that. <clears throat> um, and then the third thing is, uh, really what Mark brought up into the conversation, what Hank brought into the conversation, what Kevin is doing, what Klaus talked about, I'm sure, uh, is and, and what Doug may talk about in a moment. But we're just in the middle of major civilization shaping and possibly destroying energies that are hard at work, uh, not always doing the right thing. And how how do we cause people to shoot children less in America. I mean, uh, when Sandy Hook happened, and I realized that we were normalizing the shooting of seven-year-olds with AKs <clears throat> to the point where, um, I, I can't find this article again, but there's a woman who takes a picture of her three kids every morning before taking them to school because she wants to know what they were wearing that day in case she has to identify them by their clothing. Um, that's, that's, that's the world that we're sort of in. And things have been bad before. There's a whole bunch of other things, you know, up. But, but that's kind of uh, that. Plus, is the U.S. going to go to war with China? Plus, our, why are we ignoring climate climate change? So I, I keep trying to figure out what is the what is the Aikido move on all these things to soften people up to cooperate more? Because if we can't figure out how to cooperate more, we're not going to get there. That's that's my check-in. Thank you, Jerry. I, I just would like to ask people to think about this because um, it's something I'm I'm grappling with myself of how do we stay grounded in the midst of all this? There's, this is so much bigger than anything I ever thought that I would have to cope with. And, you know, Open Global Mind is one way I stay grounded because I check in with you folks and I have a few other, but man, it's tough right now. It's really fucking tough. And, um, it's, you know, I try to focus on the, the good and the positive and the, the things that are going on the underground that we don't see, not in the media, but the more I learn about what's going on, the harder it is to keep that despair at bay and to think, you know, we're just headed for a really bad end here. I think we've gone off the cliff and we haven't looked down yet. We're like Wiley Cody out there, you know, just not realizing that we haven't, we're about to fall really fast. So um, if anybody has thoughts on on how to be resilient in the face of that, I'd love to hear them. Mr. Carmichael. Well, my thought about how to be resilient for myself has been to reframe it uh, somewhat jokingly as, uh, you know, it's it's going to be over, but it's been a great party and we should celebrate what a great party it's been. Uh, if you go to a great party, you don't talk about, oh, it's so sad the party is over. Uh, you feel really grateful for having participated. So I realize that that's a slightly smirky uh, idea, but I find it uh, 
you know, that facing the dignity is in facing the facts as they are. And the reason to tell the truth about what's happening, which is basically we're probably not going to make it, is that only by facing the truth are things serious enough to liberate the imagination at the level that we need, which is a major restructuring, which might take cost a lot of lives, a lot of systems, a lot of difficult things. But uh, fake hope really uh, castrates imagination. Uh, and I think it's important. Uh, the most likely scenario now is that things are going to collapse much more rapidly than almost everybody thinks. The temperature is going to rise. We're going to have a hot summer that's going to affect water and food around the world, as Klaus knows. Uh, it's going to be a really difficult time. And I'm struck by how most people assume that most systems will stay in place. Uh, for example, the, when the big institutions talk about climate change, they assume that people are going to keep going to work. Uh, if people get the idea that things are really bad, they're not going to bother to go to work. Why do that? And if they don't go to work, it's going to uh, uh, tear apart supply chains. Uh, and we're going to get cascading events. Anyway, I think that just seeing how bad it is, uh, all, all high probability scenarios are terrible. We need to focus on low probability scenarios and really work hard to try and make them happen. But so far, we don't know what those would be. There is no plausible scenario right now, anywhere, for how we're going to actually limit CO2 production. It just isn't. End of rant. Thank you, Doug. Gil. You're muted. I know it's your first time on Zoom, so we'll forgive you. I was, I was, I was grooving on the silent. I thought I'd just overlay it. Uh, I was, um, I wasn't sure how to check in, but uh, Ken and Doug give me an on ramp to that story. So thank you for what you've both said. Uh, Doug, I really like what you said about the dignity of facing the facts. Uh, and I think it's part of the it, it's part of it, it's one of the one part of the answer to how do we stay grounded uh, is that um, um, important too though to <clears throat> for me at least to be careful about facing the facts and thinking that I can predict the future. And one of the places that I found grounding and solace in these last few years is, is abandoning prediction, which is a game I used to play a lot. And that's different than, than anticipating what might happen and looking at scenarios and facing the facts and imagining where we could go and what the possibilities are. Uh, but I'm really disciplining myself to get off of the notion, get off the arrogance of certainty that I understand the future. And one of the things I look to to that is all the surprises that we live with now and that I've lived with in my lifetime. I mean, six months before the Berlin Wall, wall fell, nobody, know, nobody knew that it was gonna fall. Right now, nobody, and I don't know anybody who anticipated, what, 10 years ago, that guns would become the number one cause of death of children in America. Um, and, you know, you, you can stack on examples, good and bad, of surprises that come. So I take some, some comfort in that, in imagination uh, versus prediction. Um, uh, Doug, I like what you said about low probability scenarios. Um, how do we nurture those? Um, but you know, this isn't a horse race where we're making, you know, uh, how to say this. Um, I don't mean to be preachy to anybody else by saying this, but for me, uh, I, I, I find it in my body immoral to surrender whatever the odds are. Uh, the odds might be long and I'm still in the fight for whatever I can do. I think um, there are a lot of people who have written beautifully about hope. I think Rebecca Solnit comes to mind as one of them. I encourage people to look at her work uh, if you haven't. 
Um, um, Fernando Flores, who you guys know I've been working with over the past you know half decade or so, um, has been talking a bunch about emotional fortitude, about how do we cultivate in ourselves the capacity to deal with shocks uh, without being taken down by them, um, to deal with upset, um, and you know, and praise and all sorts of things. I'm telling you, know, it's it's an, it's a discipline of learning to notice how my body reacts to news or comments or assessments from other people. And to find a groundedness and a steadiness, those of us who have done martial arts know this in the physical metaphor. How do we extend that dojo uh, into our life in community, in interaction with the news, in interaction with these possible futures, and find some kind of steadiness uh, in the midst of the insane turmoil uh, and uncertainty that we're living in? Um, so thank you guys for provoking that sort of exploration for me. Um, um, Jerry, uh, I, I am taking inspiration from your Confessions of a Cyborg. Uh, I both admire what you're doing with that, but it's also raising for me the question of if I were gonna, if I were gonna take my half a dozen possible speaking topics and turn it into one that was me now in this moment in a, in a way that contributes, what would that be? And I don't know the answer to that, but I'm very much, in that question, and you've helped provoke that, and I'm I'm grateful to you for that. Um, it's a big question for me in my work. And I, I may have talked about this with this group before. I don't recall, but a lot of my work over the decades has been working with companies to help them transition into a more sane relationship with the living world. Uh, uh, you know, the Shambhala Warrior Inside Game, uh, and I'm more and more. Um, um, uh, what's the word? Not despairing. I'm more sanguine about the ability of current capitalist corporate structures to do what needs to be done. And so I'm more of my voice is going to a kind of outside uh, the, the castle criticism um, of, uh, you know, I've talked about the structural defects of capitalism and others. And I'm, I'm perplexed about what kind of off, what, what to be doing with my life and what, what offers to be making in the marketplace now where my sense is that the things that I increasingly really want to say um, aren't going to bring me any money and might actually collapse my ability to earn money. And if I didn't have a wife who was chronically ill, I would approach that with a different kind of courage. Uh, but I feel a responsibility to approach that with some real pra pragmatic caution. So I'm in that question. Um, and would be would welcome any conversation with anybody who would care to have it, either who shares the question or has some perspective on it that I might not be seeing. Um, and on a completely different note, maybe not a completely different note, who knows, uh, in the in the generative AI, LLM, chat GPT, et cetera world, and there's been lots of conversation about that, um, um, I find myself uh, both fascinated and nervous about what this holds. Um, I commend to people um, um, uh, Ben Hunt at Epsilon Theory as one of the more intriguing voices on this subject. Um, um, he's a guy who is an, 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 an asset manager uh, and a theoretician, looks at the world a lot through, through narrative analytics. It's how he guides his investment work. Um, uh, publishes a bunch, has a weekly call on Fridays. And uh, so the perspective I'm hearing from him is that, you know, all the risks aside, this is not a 10x impact on what our capability is. It's a 100x impact, and we better get good at it. Those of us who see a, a beneficial potential use of this stuff. Yep, yeah, Pete, totally with you. So I've been dabbling a little bit uh, on some matters that concern me, some kind of just wild and exploratory, some very pragmatic. And I did one pragmatic yesterday. I have a potential <clears throat> legal issue. Um, um, from a, a deal done you know, 10 some odd years ago. It's, it's an intellectual property issue. Um, I've been getting talking with various lawyers and getting advice. And yesterday I just framed up the issue in like 200 words, very tight cogent summary and said, um, you're an intellectual property attorney. I am the owner of this business that does this. Here's the terms of the agreement. Uh, give me, here's the, here's, the, here's the issue. Please give me three possible strategies to resolve this with the least cost, time, and grief. 
and it started writing in less than three seconds. And in 20 seconds, I had a fairly cogent legal brief of framing out the issues, three different strategies, the advantages and disadvantages of each. And I thought like, holy crap, because it was not bad. I, the stuff, a lot of other stuff I've done has been about 80% good. This was 90 plus percent good. And then I said, okay, given that, um, give, me th give me three negotiating strategies to proceed on this. And you know that one took, it was probably six seconds before it started to write. And it gave me three negotiating strategies with their advantages and disadvantages. They were pretty good, frankly. And it finished by saying, you know, go talk to a real attorney because I'm not one, which is what I plan to do. But I figure it basically, you know, gave me a thousand dollars worth of legal work in two minutes. So I'm really impressed at, and, and this comes back, I know Pete, you've probably talked about this before too, the value of this thing, if it is well prompted and the importance of us developing the skills, the capacity and the sense of how to use it well, it's gonna be used bad in all kinds of ways. Uh, it's you know it's going to be used it's going to be used bad in reversion to the mean puerile low quality stuff that's probably the biggest bad people will believe it and it'll be used in evil ways but what do we do with it to support our work enhance our ability to do all the things we've been talking about in this call to do the federated um, uh, 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 you know basing the facts enhancement of the low probability uh, donut base you name it um, so I'm you can hear I've got some excitement about that because this was like a little mind blown incident for me last night. End of rant. Thank you, Gil. Yep. Stacy. I want to go back to um, what Gil was saying about the emotional fortitude, but I'm thinking this analogy might not land on a group of men, but I'm going to try it anyway. <laughs> Have you ever found a gold chain that was totally knotted up and tried to take the knot out of the chain? Okay, and you kind of shake it around in your hand because you want to loosen it up first. You don't pull it tight. And then when you, when you get that loose part, that's where you pull on. And I was thinking when Jerry, and I've heard other people talk about a keto and that's great, but I want to move a little bit away from that because even that's like an exertion of power. And I'm thinking about this gun thing. And I do see a possibility for things to shift in this last shooting because this young man that was the shooter in this bank robbery, you, I, I listened to the mother of the shooter's 911 call trying to warn people that he was going to the bank explaining that he has no weapons because she didn't know that he had bought just bought one. I listened to the neighbor talk about, he was a nice boy. I can't say anything bad about him. He actually worked there. I've heard the worst arguments from pro second amendment people. Don't let the mentally ill people have it. We don't need any more regulations. And I keep saying, more than 50% of Americans have mental health issues. And that's not the problem. The problem is anger. The problem is all this rage. And people don't live in a constant state of mental illness. That's not the issue. It's the rage and the inability to control it. And again, these laws that are, are these suppressive laws that are making people that don't feel empowered. And I'm not, in no way am I giving justification to any of the shooters anywhere. That is not the point. The point is whatever side you're on, whoever you are, when you're feeling suppressed, you can only take so much pressure before you're gonna explode. And while all of our systems where we all acknowledge that so many of our systems are changing and are due for a change. Our mental health system is one that really is going to need to change as well. And um, I guess what I wanna say, since I am a very hopeful person, is 
we really we, we do have to remember to breathe and that doesn't mean we're giving up hope or that we're not fighting but it means we're taking a step back and not behaving exactly like the people that we're claiming to say we don't want to behave like because again um You can't solve the problem with the same energy caused to create it. So if we could just ease back on our own emotional reactions, whatever the, to whatever the situation and just react just slightly less and lower, lower that volume, I guess that's my message. Thanks. Thanks, Stacey. Pete, are we ready? Always ready. <clears throat> or always not ready. So sometimes you just have to go for it. I am actually not ready to speak. I was expecting to pass today, but um, I've got my LLM chat GPT thing going in the background and it's exciting enough that I kind of wanted to, to mention it uh, so that people will be watching out for it. Um, so I apologize a little bit. I the, the funny thing is, I, so I've kind of come to the realization that ChatGPT is, a, is, is kind of like a general purpose computer. I remember um, 90, 1978 or something like that, uh, I was a volunteer employee in a, in a bite shop uh, computer store, <laughs> brick and mortar computer store of all things in 1978 in Nevada. Um, uh, I knew what a general purpose computer was good for. It was, it was good for playing, uh, doing graphics, doing sound, uh, learning how to program, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, my job kind of, the, the reason the, the kindly proprietor let me um, play with computers all day. Um, by the way, playing with a computer was a big deal. Um, our, our high school had zero computers uh, at the time, zero. Um, I, I had a little bit of access through a, a teletype uh, terminal with an acoustic modem coupler, like a World War II kind of like, you know, like, teletype machine, literally a teletype machine. That connected me and a few other people at high school to uh, uh, a mini computer, uh, a CDC 6400, which was probably as powerful as, I don't know, like a calculator in now is. But, but anyway, so I got to play with Apple II and I thought it was an amazing, wonderful tool. People would come in and say, okay, I've heard about this computer stuff. What the heck would I ever do with a computer? And, I'm, and I, I had a canned answer from the proprietor, which was, well, you can do business kinds of things. You can like write documents, you can track expenses. And I don't, I didn't have no clue. I went 17 years old. I don't had no clue why anybody would want to track expenses, but that was the canned answer I had, but you know, in the back of my head and they kind of like, eh, okay, cool. And then they go out to another store in the, in the, in the uh, strip mall. Um, so ChatGPT for me, I know it's a little bit different. You know, people know more about ChatGPT. It's more famous. It gets more memes. It, it's, you know, so I feel like whenever I talk about something cool ChatGPT is doing, most people like roll their eyes and it's like, okay, whatever. Um, you know, and they kind of like suffer through, you know, this dumb thing. Um, I, I feel, it feels to me like the first time I was playing with computers, and many people didn't get it. The first time I was playing with the internet in 1992, 93, and not many people got it. Um, uh, I remember trying to explain email. Well, I had an internet business I, in 1993, trying to explain email and, and stuff to, uh, to executives and businesses. It's like, I just, I just have my secretary type up a memo and then she photocopies it and she distributes it around the office. How is email going to be any better than that? I have no idea. I don't know what you're talking about, Pete. So anyway, thanks for letting me get all that off my chest. Um, you might have seen me uh, do a little experiment. I, so I feel like I'm doing experiments with ChatGPT and, and I feel like I kind of like put the experiment out there and it's like, okay, well, that's interesting. I don't know what I would do with that. So my last experiment was a thing called hot air. Uh, I accidentally kind of ended up having J uh, GPT-4 write a story, which was, it's pretty interesting the way it worked. Um, uh, one of our friends, Matthew Lowry uh, said, Pete, I don't think this is a story. I think it's a story treatment for a movie or something like that. And, and I kind of realized I start saying story because sometimes a story is, you know, um, 
uh, baby shoes uh, never used or something like that. It's a very short story. Sometimes it's a few sentences. Sometimes it's a chapter. Sometimes it's many chapters. Sometimes it's many volumes, you know. So story to me kind of like expands and contracts. And I have trouble explaining to, to people when I see ChatGPT writing a story, you know, I say, here's a story that I think they don't get that you can use ChatGPT to expand and contract a story in different fractal levels of it. So if I give you a, you know, hot air, the, the story of, of everything, I call these things a chapter. There's a, a vignette of something that happens and it's, you know, a, a page or two in your web browser. It's actually a very short chapter, but I know that I could go in and tell ChatGPT, hey, expand this part or contract all these chapters into bullets or, or whatever, right? So ChatGPT does this fractal jump thing uh, uh, at different levels. Uh, so, so now I'm using story to mean lots of different things of fractal different levels, levels of scale. Anyway, the thing that I was excited about enough to, to, to take time, uh, your, your time today, um, uh, yesterday on a phone call, uh, uh, was Fellowship of the Link, Jerry and me and some other uh, geeks talking about hypertext and, and tools for thinking and that kind of stuff. Um, I said, I, I ended up saying, you know, I think uh, an LLM would be a good thing to make a pattern language with because one of the things LLMs are good at is you can take a list of things and then you say expand this into different stuff, right? So I'm playing around in the background of the, the call and um, uh, Jerry had mentioned a list of business strategies, basically business, business uh, frameworks, business strategy frameworks uh, that he had on uh, one of his thoughts. Uh, he had a pretty big list of things. So I'm like, okay, well, that's an interesting list. Grab the list, gave it to ChatGPT, asked it to make more of them. So, you know, it fills in a bunch more. Um, and this morning I've said, take the list, uh, pick just the best ones, pick some more. What would you call this thing? It came up with this, uh, uh, it came up with, I asked it for a title at some point, essential uh, business strategy man management frameworks. So I, I, this morning I kind of like tried to shuffle it around and get the good ones. Um, and it did a pretty good job of kind of like giving me more and making it, it more compact and stuff. And then I've been iterating as, as Gil says, the prompt thing is kind of important. So yesterday's prompt to get it to write. Um, so, so what I did is mashed up the idea of writing a pattern language with this list of business uh, strategy frameworks. And yesterday's like, yesterday's example, you know, it was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And, you know, I posted it to the chat and then Jerry's like, Pete, I think people would be interested in that. So today's patterns are a little bit better. I've improved the prompt that says generate a pattern out of these. Um, and one of the things that I'm particularly proud of, um, pride, pride is a bad thing, but um, I'll just give you a tiny bit in chat of, and that's a bad example. <laughs> Um, one of the things I'm really, uh, really proud of is getting, and it took a couple tries to get it to give an image description because a good pattern language has, it's kind of like a recipe or a cookbook or something like that. And you have a little picture that's, you know, got a frying pan with some trout in it or something like that and some lemons and herbs and you go, oh, I get it. I, I understand what this trout recipe is about. Same thing with any kind of pattern. The architectural patterns are kind of the same. So included in the, hey, make a bunch of patterns out of these business strategy frameworks, um, make a, and, you know, describe an image. Uh, ChatGPT isn't great at, at making images yet, but of course I can take these over to Dolly or Midjourney or a Stable Diffusion. So now I've got almost a complete set of, you know, patterns. Um, I, I gave it 40 and it's still chunking through. Um, one of the things I did was to say, uh, and the bottom of each pattern put related patterns. And so it's some of the related patterns are ones in the list and some of them are outside of the list. So I think I'm going to end up with 60, 65 or 70 patterns. Um, so I'll put this on a massive wiki in a day or two. Um, and, and it seems like I'll have the start. So 
Another thing, by the way, I, I'm talking about patterns and I think I said pattern language in there. I, I'm really, I feel really protective about the term pattern language. Um, a pattern language isn't just uh, a collection of patterns. Um, it's actually got interrelationships. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, the best one, Christopher Alexander's has, has a hierarchical or, uh, uh, arrangement too talking from like chunks of cities uh, down to uh, city blocks, down to a few buildings around a courtyard, down to individual different kinds of buildings, down to rooms, down to building materials. So that hierarchy of, of stuff um, is really important. I think another thing that's really important is having patterns that have been tested. So you really want an editorial process, uh, a bunch of people who go through yeah, these these patterns really are connected to each other. So I do not pretend to say that I have created a pattern language or GPT has created a pattern language, but it's it's on the way um, and it's really a cool thing and it's something that I haven't seen before and um, and it's big and cool. So to connect this to I, it, it's funny. Um, working on business strategy patterns um, and talk having the the call talk about uh um climate catastrophe uh and other kinds of catastrophes um uh it it you know it's like great you know we're, this is a thing that we're talking about you know the the old solutions not the new solutions but to connect it to today's call um uh you could use the same technique to help coalesce the kinds of patterns that we've been talking about in this call in a uh, useful and uh, and uh, a useful way that's that's good for communicating it to other people. So um, the the output isn't necessarily the best thing to have hap you know to have in the world, but uh, the process by which I got to it is pretty good. Um, a, a small caveat there is that um, it's really easy. So the way ChatGPT works, one way to, to think of it is it remembers things. So you can say, you know, hey, describe some business strategy frameworks, and it and it remembers the, that from having read trillions of words. So um, the the uh, facility with which it's going to create new patterns. Um, it's very, still very creative and, and can come up with new things, uh, new combinations of stuff out of its memory. But um, I don't, I'm, I'm wondering, it'll be interesting to see how effective it is at creating new patterns, patterns of change and innovation that we need for the next 20 years, uh, as opposed to describing the things that, that we've had for the last 40 years. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that works. But Anyway, um, look out for um, uh, uh, you know business strategy framework um, patterns um, from from me. It'll be on a massive wiki. Um, I'll announce it on the list and on uh, Mastodon. Um, I'm super frustrated because I've decided not to post to Twitter, and so I'm missing a key um, amplifier and distribution mechanism. Um, so. I'm still not quite sure how to to resolve that, but um, but thanks. Thank you, Pete. Doug. So uh, shifting direction, what keeps us from doing the obvious, which is the, to declare the internet as the instrument for reestablishing direct democracy? Uh, that we declare the internet to be a nation. Uh, people can opt in or out, and everybody who opts in gets to vote. Uh, and we make it go large enough that it actually begins to affect policies and uh, take over uh, from the existing representative democracy and tyrannies that we have. It just seems to me it's obvious that the internet is direct democracy. Thank you, Doug. Mark. Mm. Thank you, Doug. I have to incredibly disagree. I think the internet is a tool for many things, including political manipulation. And I do not trust the internet. Um, I'd like to talk about emotional resilience. And I agree with Stacy. lower the volume. 
Yeah, we can lower the volume. I can raise the volume. I have an emotional range. And when I push and repress that, yeah, here's the metaphor of pressure and pressure cooker. If people are saying, you're triggering me, I go, you know what? I'm glad. Your triggering is not my responsibility. It's on you. Now, if you would like to have a discussion, how I could be lighter. I can smile. I can be, you know, yeah, let's have an emotional conversation. That's that's humanity. And repressing humanity is fucked. Now, wokeness has hurt more of my friends than Donald Trump and everything he's done. And I'm wondering about that. It's weird. So I live in San Francisco. I have a trans friend that related to me uh, uh, you know, in a conversation when, when another trans friend of hers or his, I mean, they're transitioning. So um, said, I fear pronouns. And I'm like, oh. I totally understand. I've changed my pronouns to any and all, but that was changed from dude and brother. I really like masculinity. I love femininity. And for people to basically tell me what that is, hell no. I'm going to fight back. But if I trigger you, it's on you. Don't force me to fit in your younger or older or not me emotional framework because I don't accept it. I'm me. I'll express me. I'll express me appropriately and inappropriately. And if, if it's inappropriate for you, be happy to talk about it. And I'll be happy to you know, tone it down. Thank you. Jerry, and I'm going to turn over to you because I have to go in a second. So go ahead. Um, thanks, Ken. Uh, and thank you for hosting. That was, that was delightful. Uh, and we're at the end of our time as well. So we'll just wrap up pretty quickly. Uh, but a couple things. The, the call that I was late here for was me facilitating a group conversation that was kind of about China <clears throat> the future of the world and a bunch of other stuff. And to my surprise, the first quarter of the conversation after a couple of people presented was about wokeism, because one of the presenters basically made the assertion that wokeism or wokeness is one of America's best exports. It's going to change the world. And, and he kind of surprised a bunch of people on the call. I could sort of tell. And we had an interesting discussion that could have gone a lot longer. But I tried to do a little bit of definition around woke because uh it's this really thorny word now kind of on purpose because the far right is basically weaponizing the word and blowing oxygen on it so that anytime somebody says woke everybody's like ah that's the worst thing in the world and i'm like people woke woke just means being awake to horrible things that have happened to people who are not the pale patriarchal penis people like me and acknowledging them and maybe trying to do something about it that is all that woke means and everybody's like okay, I got that. And there was one black person on the call who was like, I taught everybody jazz hands. And he was like, yeah, that's it. And then we went on a bit and did some more stuff. And I'm, I'm extremely interested in the, the dangerous politics of woke and wokeism because I, I am not post-woke. I don't think woke is dead. I think woke is really interesting. And I'm really intrigued that somebody actually thought that woke was a major American export because for me, woke might actually destroy this country because of the because of the battles being fought over it right now. Anyway, just wanted to come back in and say there that I'm interested in a creative way of framing a conversation around woke as one of our call topics. Maybe next week is a topic call. We do something like that. Um, let, 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 let's do that. <clears throat> and let's let's figure out in the OGM town square how to step into that conversation in a useful way. What would outcomes be that we would like or what would... I, I'm open to, to whatever framings you want to sort of uh, throw in for how to do that. But I, I love the I love the idea. Not afraid of the subject at all. Um, 
would love also to create resources for others to use, et cetera. See you, Ken. Thank you. Um, but let's see. So um, thank you all. Uh, Gil, Michael, then we're going to wrap the call. Uh, Gil, you're muted. You think of Lauren, like Ken said. Uh, newbie, first time on Zoom, I understand. I know. Um, uh, thank, thank you for that. I think your definition of woke is spot on. Uh, the danger of woke is not the danger of woke. It's the danger of weaponized, money-controlled, polarized politics in America, which will destroy any concept uh, that you throw into it. So that's, you know, kind of meta-meta. But let's have that conversation for sure. Um, um, Mark, you talked about the, you know, the, 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 the challenge du jour of, hey, you're triggering me. Um, you know, you're triggering, you're triggering me presumes that I am a machine. And it presumes that we are a machine and we're not. Uh, and so, um, you know, I can say, I feel angry when you say that, but that's a different kind of responsibility in the conversation. That's part of where the emotional fortitude conversation lives. It's like, you know, um, every, somebody's opinion is their opinion. I can take their opinion or not take their opinion. I can be reactive to it. And this is part of the martial arts training is to, you know, is to learn to not freak out and have your breathing change and your balance go awry when somebody charges at you with a weapon. You can actually cultivate different physiological responses, different neurochemistry um, in your body, which is where all this emotional stuff is coming from anyway. Um, on a lovelier note, I caught a little YouTube last night of Ian McKellen, Sir Ian McKellen, pretty contemporary, you know, in, 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 in his old age, talking about going back to Manchester for a visit and getting into a taxi. Um, and the cabbie said to him, where are you going, love? And he said, this is such a remarkable thing. This is like a middle-aged man talking to, regardless of gender, the passenger uses love as the pronoun. And he thought, how nice is that for us to address each other as, hello, love. That's all. Thank you. Too bad you're not last in the lineup because that's a really nice end note for a call. But Michael, it's up to you. Well, Michael off and we'd be done. <laughs> <laughs> Jump on okay. in. I'll, I'll, um, I'll embellish that so it can still be the, the sort of ending point which is um, to, um, to say that I love, and, and this is something I was gonna, gonna say, independent of what Gil said, um, that I love non-gendered pronouns and, and lament the fact that gendered pronouns were ever created. They're, you know, they're a pain in the ass when applied to non-people um, in, in other, as we know, coming from a language that doesn't have genders for objects, um, you know, the fact that they're gendered in other, other languages is a pain. And the fact that humans' uh, pronouns are gendered um, is not universal. And were it not to be the case, and it's really bizarre when you think about it, imagine if we had um, pronouns that told you before you knew anything else about somebody, what race they were or what height they were or what age they were. And we do that with gender. Why? I mean, it, it's just silly. <laughs> and, and, you know, the fact that we have to create this grammatically inappropriate pronoun of, of they, because we wouldn't dream of using it the way we do in English, but, you know, the French don't. Um, I mean, it, if we if we'd started off using it for humans the way we do for animals we don't know the gender of until we say he and she it, it wouldn't have that negative common connotation of oh you're 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 objectifying me you're turning me into a thing um which you know i get is offensive 
anyway, so three cheers for for un ungendered pronouns and and can we have more of them? And Gil, love is a beautiful one. Thank you. We could just blend she and it and call everyone shit. No, <laughs> like, that doesn't that doesn't work well. I like love better. <clears throat> love is love is so much better. I, I do like that better. And Pete, thanks for finding that clip. I'm gonna go watch it right now. El amor. El amor. So Spanish, French, German, all they, they all have genders. It's like, then you have to remember that each thing, even though it doesn't naturally seem like a male or a female, is in fact called female or female in languages. And it doesn't map that nicely across languages outside of language groups. So your German pronouns, your German whatever, aren't going to match the Latin, Latinate ones. And ah, what a pain. But maybe that's interesting. Why is that? Well, how does yeah. that work differently in different places? What does that mean in different places? Anyhow, lots to go. I'm I'm studying Spanish now, and one of the hardest things is to get that gender matching. Um, the easiest way to get through that is to like grow up hearing it, so that you know when something is off. Of That's course. it. Yeah. It's like, damn it. Yeah. Uh, basically, listen to Spanish um, uh, telenovelas, um, and, and also and also I'm music. To that, Mark, not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it, again, and, and you know, we are at the end of the call, but the the immersion to basically just you know have it on in the background while you're gardening. That that's a great, that's a great idea. That that'd be my supplement to Duolingo. Yep. Got to go, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Good day, loves. All right. Good day, love. Good day, loves. See ya. Bye, loves. Thanks. Thanks, Hank. Thanks, Stacy. Thanks, Jerry. Bye, Mike. Take care.